He's just laughing. <laughs> you were born? How? Uh, Your mom? Uh, Your mom? Uh, How? Uh, she okay. could not have a baby. Okay. Um, I think you all know the story of uh, Justice. His background and my background, I know they, I mean, they, 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 they're just the same. We all came from that kind of community. And so, um, uh, you see, one, one aspect about the African life is this. Poverty forces them to seek protection from the spiritual world. Do you understand what I'm saying? Poverty. The inability to make ends meet forces us to seek spiritual or divine help because we believe that that is where we can get it from. And because of this, and our ignorance, our inability to read, we are forced to swallow anything that comes our way. And it makes it easier when the person asking you to believe what he or she is saying is older than you. That age issue was also another factor to force us into that condition. We were not brought up to question our parents. That was the kind of community we were all living in. In the morning, you be asked, you have to follow whether you're going to the farm or you're going to the beach or whatever it is like that. That's, I mean, that is the work for you to do, and then you'll be doing that. So education was actually with the with the privilege, those who were able to make ends meet and to send their children in there. With my story, my parents struggled to have a baby. They were just you know, struggling, actually. Mother and father did everything they could to get a child. They were not able to do that. So they finally ended up at a fetish priest who promised that uh, he could do something for them to have a baby. Which doctor? Which doctor? And the witch doctor said that my mother will get pregnant and the result will be someone that they will not be able to handle as a child. The, that person will be, will, 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 will rise up against them, will rise up against the status quo in the in other, in other words, the, they were not able to say that my mother will be giving birth to someone who will become an evangelist, someone who will become a preacher, whatever it is like. So they were putting it in that type of way, putting some you know mysteries around the whole thing. My mother was given some conditions to <coughs> observe. One condition was that when I was, when, 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 I, when I'm born, my hair is supposed to be shaved all the time. I shouldn't have any air around me all the time. And then I should be smeared with, you know, some kind of uh, whitish, you know, chalk type or whatever it is like that. And I shouldn't go to school. If I was going to school for me, that child, which is me, would be a taboo for them. And that will not, in 
in other words, uh, if they if they ever put me to school, they will lose me. I will die. They put all kinds of things. I mean, they, they give them all kinds of things to make the whole thing so mysterious. But as God will have it, I was conceived. So my parents were forced to believe that it was that witch doctor who did something for me to you know, be born. Only for me to come and tell them later that for any time God initiates a, a redemptive plan, the devil runs quick ahead to sort of deceive. So, so my parents believed that it was this witch doctor that, you know, were to have me come to this world, until later on the through the preaching of the gospel, they got to know that it was not true at all. So they didn't want me to go to school. According to them, they didn't want me to go to school. But when I was at the age of four, I told them that I would go to school. And I would force myself, dressed up, not in any uniform, but with, you know, this type of clothes, and then find myself in school. Until the teacher, you know, came and consulted my parents and said that this child, anytime there is school something, you will see him standing at the gates and he wants to go to school. And why wouldn't you send him to school? And they will be giving that teacher all kinds of stories until the teacher took it upon himself to say that I want to train this child. And that's how I got to go to school. But life was really, really hard. Life was really hard. Being the firstborn, and we understanding what we call uh, birthright or whatever it is like that. In Africa, you will do everything. You will do everything. I mean, all the dog jobs and everything in the house you have to do because you are the, you know, the first child. So a typical morning, I will walk about five miles to go and look for water walk for five miles sometimes i don't sleep we go in groups of you know children and parents and then we go and wait on this water to come out of the ground then with little cups you know we fetch it small small you know with little bucket maybe a gallon each and then we'll carry it another five miles to come back home and then we'll take a cup of this water maybe a small cup and then we will go to the sea and you know we swim sort of use the sand to you know wash ourselves and use that small water to wash the salt out of our skin and off we go to school with no food because mama is gone daddy is going to look for food to you know have a square meal for the day and sometimes when they leave in the morning to go by 5 a.m., they will come back around 4 or 5. Life was a little bit hard. Yeah. And sometimes I find myself in school during break time, you know, just going from class to class and trying to make friends at least to get some crumbs that is coming out from, you know, their hands for me to eat. And sometimes teachers also will consider me, send me out, and then when they come, yeah, they just give me something to eat in that way. That took me through to the primary, and I got through the junior, and then started with the senior high. But because of the kind of religion my parents, you know, took us through, 
I had that inward instinct that there is a God, but I didn't know who that person was. So in conformity to what I was trained, you know, to do, each morning I would just say something I didn't understand in order for me to go to school until January 1977, Gideons came to the school and at the general assembly, after praying with us, opened boxes and started distributing the Gideon New Testament to each student. I was very curious with that. So when I had my own, I left everything behind and read my little book, that New Testament, from cover to cover. At the end of that little book was my decision written. Whoever is familiar with Gideon Bible will understand what I'm saying. That was one week? <coughs> yeah, one week I read through everything. Mm -hmm. I was not sleeping, I was not I just wanted to, and I was fascinated with, I mean, seeing the word Jesus, 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 through, you know, healing and whatever it is, and my grand my grandmother and my mother were in that traditional healing business so i was interested to know more about you know what this uh, person called jesus would do so i went through the decision and seriously honestly followed through the decision and prayed the, the sinner's prayer and it's very powerful it brought a change to my life a change that I didn't, I mean, as, as I saw it as a miracle. The way I talked, the way I was doing things in the house completely different. And so my parents began to be suspicious as to whether I've had some brain, you know, problem. Because to them, to read a Bible from page to page, you know, that is one of the taboos. You will get crazy. You don't have to do that. But I did that. And I began to take, you know, my experience to them one by one. Any opportunity I get, I will talk to my grandmother, I will talk to my, 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 my father, my mother. And it was against the tradition. You, don't, you can't do that you know, to your parents. But those, those were some of the revolutionary things that I was doing. And they understood. Because the Holy Spirit was working. I didn't know about that. But they believed the message, comparing it to my life pattern, what I was doing. I began to do good things as I gained what I was doing. I began to stand up for the truth as I gained what I was doing. So they saw the dichotomy between my new life and my old life. And so they began to pay attention to what I was saying. I counted the number of my family line beginning from my grandmother, grandfather, down to my generation, and we were 77 in number. Some were living in different places, you know, in Ghana. But I located where each one was, and within three months, I was able to reach all of them with the gospel message, I mean, the experience that I had. And by God's grace, led all of them to faith in Jesus Christ and baptized all of them. So that is how I became a Christian. And I continue with, you know, my schooling. But I wanted to become a pilot throughout my whole life. I was interested to become a pilot. And I was studying extra courses, you know, with that once I was in high school. And that took me to Liberia because when I applied it in Ghana, I was told that uh, they can train pilots right from the scratch. They normally fall on retired Air Force pilots to use them for the commercial. So if I really want to become a pilot, then I should go to the Air Force. And so I did apply. 
God endowed me with intelligence. So in my high school results, I qualified for it. And even more than that, because they wanted me to now become the Air Force, I mean, <clears throat> Air Force, uh, this is an air traffic uh, controller, but I didn't like that. Those who are very good in, in physics, in mathematics, and in geography, they are normally asked to do the work at the tower. Those who control the planes up and down, they call them the air traffic controllers. They wanted me to do that. I said, no, I don't want to really do that. I wanted to become a pilot. So, well, if you, that's, the, that's what we can offer. So the Air Force commander, when I was leaving the room, came to me and said, a young man, please take that offer we are giving to you. I said, no, I didn't want that. I didn't know that God was really working at that time. So my uncle told me that the Israelis uh, were in Liberia recruiting, you know, pilots for the Liberian Air Force. So I flew to Liberia. And the day I landed was the day also they finished with the recruitment. So I didn't get it. And that broke me down. That really broke me down. So I ended up, you know, in the church and uh, a friend of mine told me that <laughs> man proposes but God disposes. That's what he told me. I didn't understand all that he was saying. So I decided to fast for three days. Not eating anything. Wanted God to give me a direction to what he wants me to do. At the end of that three days, I didn't hear anything from him. I read my scriptures and everything. I didn't hear anything. I didn't get any direction as to what he wants to do with my life. The following day, when I was not fasting and just in the house, I was in my room and reading my Bible. After reading it, I put it aside and I was just, you know, quiet. Then I heard a voice. I thought that somebody was calling me in the house. So I opened my door, went, and said, looking for who was calling me. Either it was my mother or my auntie or my daddy or whatever. But nobody was in the house. Me alone. So I came back to my room and the voice came back again. Pick the Bible. Open to Psalm 110 verse 4. The first one I had, the second thing. So I took it and read it. And goosebumps, you know, fell on me. I was scared. I mean, <laughs> I was really scared. The verse said, I swore by myself after the order of Melchizedek that you are a priest forever. The next thing was to see myself in the church that day. The next thing was to see myself in the church. I sat in the middle of this church. No one was there because it was Monday. No one was there. Confused, not knowing exactly what to do. Then someone appeared walking down the aisle and came to me. And all that he said is that, young man, don't run away from God and pass by. Then I said, I think God is speaking. So I need to make up my mind. So I went to see the pastor about it. He encouraged me and began the seminary. In the course of doing that, God also began to show me what he wants me to do. When God calls you, he trains you. 
But the third aspect of his calling is what many times we make mistakes as ministers of the word. The direction of your call. Where specifically is he calling you to go? And so all the time what was coming through my mind was the coast for Christ. The coast for Christ. The coast for Christ. And I will be having some revelations and dreams about it. And so my heart was directed towards loving the fisher folks. Naturally. They are about five million of them along the coast. They are the most poorest people that I've ever seen. Poorest in terms of education, literacy level, in terms of access to basic social amenities like schools, hospitals, you know, basic vocational skills to be able to uh, be marketable in the economic world. That was not with these fisher folks. And that's where God said, that's what I'm sending you to. And so if you hear about Coastal Christ Ministries, Coastal Christ Ministries, that's all it is. To be able to transform the life of these fisher folks. For them to have self-worth. And I understood. Because that is where my mother and father lived. And gave birth to me. And through the struggle, brought me this far. So God is asking me to go back there and use them as their point of contact to spread along the coast. That's what happened. And since that time, many churches have been planted and because I didn't want to become a one-man church, you know, Uno or whatever it is like that, with my Baptist background, I gave those churches to the Baptist denomination. And then went on with the other side of Coastal Christ Ministries, giving education to the young ones, providing safe drinking water for communities that do not have you know, water, giving uh, entrepreneurial skills to women and youth who were not privileged to go to school, so carpentry, mason, fashion designing, Coastal Christ was providing all those things, you know, in the communities along the coast. And Ghana's coast uh, stretches about 330 miles, you know, from one border to the other. And because we could not reach all of them, we used the capitals, the capital cities or capital towns we establish and then we train them so that they can also spread to the communities in the Malon. Yes, yesterday I received a message that uh, our school in Hafasin is going to graduate the second batch of people in fasting training. I mean, 20 of them, you know, of these young ones, age 18 to 25, but who have, you know, children. You know, they have children by way of Maybe some of them get pregnant because they want to find something to eat, you know, and that's how they end up in the business like that. So when you are now 66 years old, a time will come when the knee 
will not help you to move again. So what will you do? And so for the past three years, I'm training the next, you know, leaders who will come and continue with the work. Yeah. So that is where my concentration now is. Training those who will come and, and take care. I'm finished with the school. I'm done with the uh, distant, um, the hospital, by way of the children, all the three, you know, who are medical doctors. Uh, with the fishing ministry, I've already gotten three of them also. One who is in charge of the canoe, the other who is in charge of the net, and then the other one who is in charge of the outboard motor. Okay. And uh, giving them basic um, stewardship principles. But with the fishing ministry, the fashion designing and all those things, we we will preach like um, uh, Chick Fil A. Okay, we we train them so that they own it themselves to be able to help with others. Yeah, we had four fishing, you know, uh, canoes. Now we are left with one, and these other people also are now getting to the point where they can maintain and sustain you know uh, the, 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 the ministry uh, so that they can also train the next generations to, to do that as well. how do we receive our funding i think most of you are aware of it and the last um, uh, boat that um, got wrecked by uh, nature because we had know wind storm that blew the, all the canoes from the sea you know crashed them to the beach and then uh, thousands of people lost their livelihood and it was really sad I mean it was really sad and so I prayed and uh, relayed a message to Ryan and others and praise be to God they are now back you know and they are very happy that they can least have something to eat and also to be able to share their message you know to the others the fishermen uh, like Jesus did that is the same strategy I also used because they cannot read and write I put the gospel on their fingertips their left hand and then their right hand for discipleship their left hand is the witnessing tool, and then their right hand, the discipleship tool. And it will take five weeks for them to, you know, learn it by heart, I mean, put it in their minds. So to remind some of you, uh, you know it already, but to remind some of you, uh, we will train them to use their fingers to remember the scripture. So this little finger stands for God gave man, man being humanity, gave man life. Genesis 2 7. So we will, we will um, study this in their language and then uh, train them about it and give them one week to come back to see whether they can still remember. When they pass, then we take them to the next level that man rejected life Romans 3 23 I think Genesis 2 7 we know it that God took the dust from the ground and you know made man out of it and breathed through his nostrils and man became a living being Romans 3 23 tells us that man rejected life all have sinned and come short of the glory of God so they will learn this and then the third week they will come and say God through Jesus Christ gave man new life that is Romans 6 23 for the wages of sin is death but the gifts of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord then the fourth week they will come and then they will learn that this new life must be received by man or man must receive this new life and that is John 1 12 
he came to his own, but his own did not accept him. But as many as received him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. Then the fifth week, they will learn that this new life must be seen by all. And that is 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. All full things have passed. Behold, all things have become new. So this fisherman will use these five weeks and put the scripture, you know, on their fingertips. And some of them, for them not to forget when they are witnessing, you see their hand like this as if they have some problem with their hand. But just for them to remember in order to share their faith. And they have used this to plant many churches along the coast. What do they do? What they do is that when they launch out there on the sea, they pause for a while and then do church service on the sea. That which they don't do is Lost Supper and Baptism and then offering. But everything that is done in the local church, they do it on the sea. And that also attracts other canoes to come around them to hear the gospel message. When they come ashore, after doing everything, Tuesdays, they go to these fishermen that they witness to, you know, to share with them the, uh, the gospel. And those who receive the gospel, they will use their right hand, you know, to do the discipleship training. And this one also, this little finger stands for assurance of salvation. And that is first John 5, 12. If you have the son, you have life. If you don't have the son, you don't have life. Then we we'll go to the, they will take one week to learn this. The second week, they will teach them about prayer. Because you can't have a relationship with God without praying. And that one also, we take it from Luke 18, 1. That man ought to pray without, you know, ceasing of him. Then we go to the third finger, uh, which is the third week that you must study the scriptures. You must study the scriptures. And that one also, we take it from 2 Timothy 2, 15. Study to show yourself approved. A workman who dare not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. They will take another week to learn this. Then they will come to the fourth week where they will learn about the importance of fellowshipping at the church level where you need to join believers on Sundays you know, to worship the Lord. And we take the scripture from Hebrews 10.25 where the scripture admonishes us not to uh, stop with the meeting of our believers together, especially when we see them the end time approaching. Then, of course, we will go to the fifth week with a fifth finger, and that is also witnessing. Okay, Acts 1 8. And he shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and he will be my witnesses. So, so they will use this to, you know, disciple the new converts. And uh, it, it's just so wonderful that. They, they are revolutionizing the coast, especially, you know, when you buy palm or the river and that. That's what we do with the fishing ministry. Now, when they go and uh, they have these two, you know, uh, uh, vision. One is catching men, and then the other is catching fish. So when they catch the fish, which is the economic aspect of it, the you know a typical boat owner in ghana who owns a boat and puts 20 or 40 people on boat when they go out there and catch fish they will divide it into four and then the boat owner will take three and then the crew of 40 will take only one so just imagine if they go and they get hundred dollars the boat owner will take um, 75 and then the 25 will go to crew of 40 with their wives and dependents. So it's economic slavery in that they go through over there. But with Coast for Christ Ministries, they take half and then they keep the half for the sustenance of the ministry themselves. So they open an account and two of them become secretaries with one staff from Coast for Christ Ministries become secretary to that 
and then they manage you know their own thing how to maintain it because sometimes if they go out there they will cast the net and then uh, unknowingly it will just you know fall on rock and, you know and then tear it you know all those things like that so they come and maintain it in that way so it's very uh, interesting ministry and uh, many other uh, uh, missionaries from other nations have come to learn the model what goes for Christ ministry is doing yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so. so um two oh seven I mean uh Reverend Cash uh came with uh, with Ryan. I I I I known Reverend Cash in Liberia. Mm -hmm. I known him in Liberia when I went there to plant a church. Okay, there and uh he and I became good friends uh, he will not do the major work he will not lay blocks he will not do all those big big type of jobs but his job that he was doing caught my attention you see when they lay the blocks they don't dress it then Robert will be gradually dressing it up in such a way that you don't need to plaster it so he was specializing in beautifying the whole project using that little you know strategic uh, things that he was doing yeah and so we learned so much uh, from each other and uh, uh, when he saw that the same project i carried out in liberia was going on in ghana um, the same team you know came and one of his trips i think second or third or so he came with ryan and uh, the first time i saw him it was like david and jonathan you know i just grabbed him and i uh, said no i mean god brought you here for a purpose <laughs> yeah and since then i've loved him and wanted to multiply myself in him yeah and I think it has worked and God has blessed him also with I mean uh, a beautiful woman uh, Sarah Sarah uh, I don't know these two people uh, they are, they are, they are, they are. I'm not saying it because you people are here but I know them you know um, they have built their lives from the scratch you know they have built their life from the scratch i mean going through uh you know revolutionary challenges i mean sometimes they have to make some big decisions i mean sometimes it's not been done but they have to go through it and very often they're not a little push a little word one little word you know will see them through and, and that's how they've been all over but they have the the heart for missions they have the heart for human humanity and they have you know the heart for the values of life what life is all about it's not about money it's not about fame it's about improving the quality of life of the poor poor that's what i see in the two of them that's why you know i spend my time with them because that's my focus you know this is like it will remain that way until uh, the house being sisters and sister, call home and then they continue you know with what is happening yeah, yeah. and then the, the last thing the status of the hospital tell us about the hospital yes um i told you at first that those people were were less privileged in terms of having access to basic social amenities and one of them is this health care centers we were in a room like this not like this in terms of you know <laughs> gather together like that and missionaries were all around me planning to do you know the following day's mission then at the door i mean desperately 
Whoa, Mr. Prince, I what was happening? Because I heard nothing before. So I asked for excuse and I went there. And that was around two, three, four. Here is this desperate woman. No shoe, no handkerchief, whatever it is, like a half dressed. You could see that the woman was desperate. Cool down. Cool down. What is it that has brought you here? And not knowing that she had a two year old baby, two year old baby, dying from malaria and anemia. Carry this baby to the community hospital. And that is about six miles from where we were and where she lived. Took the child there. The health personnel there were interested in she paying before attending to the child. She begged them, but they wouldn't listen. So she left the baby there, and she had nowhere to go but to go to the pastor's house and knock at the gates. That's how we came together. So I came inside, shared her story, and were able to get more than what she needs to pay for the child. She um, needed to. And that is 25 cents. Mm. 25 cents to cure that child. 25 cents to bring that life back. They were interested in the 25 cents and not the life. And when the woman had the $12 to go back there, she made the baby dead. Baby died. The baby died. So she came back running, crying, and saying that, Pastor, the baby died. And that caught me. And no, I can't live among these people and start burying babies. So I shared the idea with Reverend Dan Hodges, the late Reverend Dan Hodges. And, uh, he came here and uh, what followed was me coming here and that was 2000, the year 2000. So he took me to various churches to share my story and we were able to raise 33,000 for the hospital project. So the following year, which was 1999, he came with Carpenters for Christ. And within eight days, <coughs> they had raised that hospital to a little level for us to continue and to complete it. And since that time, I can tell you that the mortality rate is very, very low. And many people now can walk to the hospital. No more six miles. But less than a mile, they are having access to this health care. 200 beds. 200. Started with 16, and now we are growing to 200. And our government officials come there for health care. Government mm -hmm. officials. Government yeah. officials. And people from our neighboring countries also come. And we are blessed to have medical team, surgical team and nurses. They come every year to do surgeries. And so you have people coming from Togo, from Cote d'Ivoire, all coming you know, to do cases in that manner. One challenge that we had in sustaining the medical mission 
was to have our own trained doctors. Because if you don't have a resident doctor, the government also will not license you to do that. And so, um, <laughs> but where is the money to train them? But God provided. And now we have three of them from within us who happen to be my children. All three of your children. All three who are now <laughs> medical doctors taking care of the hospital. And not only that, but they take the hospital to the rural communities on wheels also. Yeah. Just last night, Dan was up me and said that, Daddy, I'm just true with my uh, surgical cases, you know, he had done hernia cases and those things like, and he was just replaced. I'm tired. I said, that's, that's the beginning of the work. You are coming up and I'm going down. So that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. So that's about the ministry which you all, you all have contributed to bring it where it is now. You all. Yeah. And, uh, I have to thank God for the Clopton family again because I think he played an important role for me to have uh, a stipend for one year, $100 a month for one year. Yeah. Um, Dan and him got together, raised money in the Western Baptist Association, thousand two, you know, for me to receive uh, that stipend every month. How about that? Yeah. So, when? Uh, what year? You said what year? That was nineteen ninety eight. Oh, cash. Who, who did that? Robert Cash and okay. then Dan Hodges. Okay. 